All right. So it's six o'clock. We can go ahead and get started. Right. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our first Zoom webinar. Um, my name is Emily Kulzer and I am the Director of Museum Operations here at the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. Um, and tonight we have uh, Ann Broughton, um, who is an Associate Professor in the Apparel, Retail, Merchandising, and Design Program at uh, North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, she has been on the faculty at NDSU since 1991. Uh, she is also the curator of the Emily Reynolds Historic Costume Collection at NDSU, which is an archive of over 5,000 clothing and textile items that reflect the history of the region, the history of fashion, and international dress. The clothing of North Dakota suffrage uh, Kate Selby Wilder is part of the Emily Reynolds uh, collection and inspired Anne to learn more about Wilder's life, her role in the campaign for women's suffrage, and the role women's clubs played in that effort. Uh, so without further ado, take it away, Anne. All right. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Well, it, I, it's um, interesting to be able to communicate with people via Zoom. And so, um, so what I have um, for you today is a, a presentation that that um, it's based on a PowerPoint um, slide presentation, but it looks at, at um, the role of women's clubs in working for the vote. And so I started this work probably 10 years ago, getting to know Kate Selby Wilder um, a little bit more, you know, through her clothing, but then wanting to know more about her life. And so um, for the last probably eight years, maybe, maybe a little bit less, um, you know, I've kind of dived into her her life and her roles, and and as I did that, I realized how important women's clubs were to organizing women to get the vote, and so that's what I'm going to touch on this evening. And let's see, I have to figure out how to advance. Here we go. And so, just a little background um, with with um, the start of of uh, the organized women's rights. Um, uh, convention, it, they, the first one occurred in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, and women got together and came up with a, a variety of issues that um, they were upset at and wanted to work towards change. And, um, and so they included suffrage, which is getting the right for, uh, for women to vote, property rights, more liberalized divorce laws, uh, child custody rights, temperance, abolition of slavery and then dress reform. And so with, with suffrage, that was an issue that, that um, was decided by states and that was one of the approaches, but the federal amendment is what we're celebrating the centennial of this year. With property rights, that was basically a, a state issue. And, and so women worked to gain more control over the property that they would bring into a marriage and their, the wages that they earned at one time the, the money that they would earn um, on their own in a marriage would go to the husband. And, and there were stories of, of husbands that would take the money that a woman earned and walk away from the family. Um, and so the woman would have to, the wife would have to work to pay off debts and then, you know, started being successful. He would come back after abandoning her for several years, but because they were still legally married, he could take the money that she had earned and the property that she had earned. Um, and so, you know, so that was something that, that states uh, worked to adopt and change. Um, more liberalized divorce laws and, and um, making it easy for, easier for a woman to file for a divorce um, as, or a man. Um, child custody, in many states, if a man and woman divorce, the man would automatically get the children. And, and, um, and so, um, you know, even if a woman, um, you know, was the bigger caregiver, you know, the man had the right to do that. Temperance was something that, that um, which is uh, being temperate in the consumption of alcohol was an, an issue that was important to um, these folks. Um, the abolition of slavery, so abolitionists worked very closely with suffragists for a great amount of time. Eventually, after slavery was granted without granting women the right to vote, there was a, a separation between the, the partnership between abolitionists and, and suffragists, and then dress reform. And so with, with the cartoon that I have showing on the right-hand side where the cursor is now, that's showing a, um, a, a photo of two women walking in London. It's in the Punch magazine from 1855 with kids, um, you know, 
catcalling them and teasing them. And, you know, people are looking askance at these women walking down the street in bloomer outfits, which were thought to be a more rational form of dress. So there's a whole movement called rational dress um, in dre the dress reform movement. The, the smaller picture at the bottom of the, the slide shows a man and a woman, but the woman is in that big bell-shaped skirt and a very tight-fitting uh, bodice. And so as a woman walked along, the skirt would dip into the soil and the uh, majority of, of, um, you know, of uh, the animals pulling um, carts and carriages, they would you know, drop things in. And so women would, on their skirts, bring filth into the home. And so that was an issue. You, know, you could also you know, touch a fire if there's an open flame, you'd start on fire and you wouldn't be able to tell. And so anyway, the dress reform movement came up with the, this idea of a bloomer outfit. Um, and it was actually originally called Turkish Trousers, but a woman named Amelia Bloomer, uh, she was a, a, an editor of a magazine called The Lily, and she was a big proponent of the bloomer. So they, be, get, they began to call Turkish Trousers bloomers after Amelia Bloomer. And, um, and so anyway, dress reform was part of that, that um, first set of issues as well. With, with um, you know, the, the reason so many things had changed is because industrialization had changed family life. And the, the idea, you know, starting in around the 1870, this, the um, uh, Industrial Revolution began in the textile industry, but steam power was speeding up the uh, production of textiles as well as other things that required, you know, at one time very slow hand-operated spinning wheels or um, other uh, operations that, that you know, were hand labor. And as time went on and mechani mechanization occurred, people moved into urban areas. And so women stayed at home, men went to work. So men were part of the, the public sphere and were in charge of work and politics, and women were part of the, the private sphere, and they were in charge of the home. Then as time went on, as we moved into the 1860s um, with the, the Civil War and the needs that were brought on um, by you know, the, the needs of war, um, and then um, afterwards, more and more young women especially began going into factories, um, including textile mills and sewing factories, offices as typists and clerks. Um, women became teachers as well as men, but teaching was a profession that women, women were able to move into, nursing. And then as, as the land grant university opened up as a public institution for the common man, then more and more public educational facilities for higher education were open to women. And so more and more women were, were gaining a university education and going on into um, um, the law um, as well as, as uh, being physicians and, and um, having uh, more decision-making ability. So industrialization um, was kind of the start of it all. You know, some anti-suffrage arguments are always interesting to take a look at because it helps you kind of see what society was, um, you know, saying uh, as far as why women, you know, shouldn't have the right to vote. And, and so this pamphlet that I, that I have on the right side of the screen was a, a folded pamphlet, a small uh, pamphlet that was an uh, anti-suffrage pamphlet, but it, it, on the inner two pages, it had a list, several lists of household tips. On the back side, it had, had a list of reasons about why to vote no on women's suffrage. And so, you know, just to quickly go through them, 90% of women don't want the vote or don't care. And, or the vote will mean competition of women with men instead of cooperation. There was also concern about women who were married. Um, when they would vote, they would either double or annul their husband's vote. And so, um, you know, it, it was a concern that there, a family would have two votes. Um, then the expense of, uh, and the cost of having women vote would not be commensurate with the, the, um, the expense of having that done. It wouldn't add that much value. Um, and, you know, it would put government under the petticoat rule. And the other thing is just, you know, a fear of the unknown. It's unwise to risk the good that we have with the evil which may occur. And so uh, as we move closer into the progressive era and looking at, at Minnesota argu anti-suffragist arguments in particular, we see that women, um, you know, they, women work for the home inside, men work for the home outside. And there is the idea that man can't assume women's functions. The division of labor was ordained by God. 
And so this was a very strong viewpoint that, that um, you know, men um, didn't know how to do or couldn't figure out how to do um, things related to the home. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that was kind of new with the progressive era is that that they were saying that women aren't physically equipped to stand straight in political life. As we move into the 1900s, we see that women's suffrage was gaining attention. In part, it was because of, of um, uh, the, um, the increase in, in actions and the increasing publicity of militant British suffragists. Um, there was also um, more people that, that um, uh, were being involved of women's, um, in women's organization. The rise of the labor movement was another thing. And I have to um, see if I can get the, I have things that are hiding in the slide in the reaction to industrialization. There, the last one. Okay, and so these things, they all, all kind of came together um, to make women's suffrage more in the public eye. And so we have a picture from Punch magazine again, and here it's a picture of a, a woman suffragist who's actually called a suffragette, I believe. And, um, and so women in the suffrage movement in Britain reclaim that derogatory term suffragette, meaning the little suffragette, um, the little woman in charge or in favor of suffrage. And here she is moving up the, the rock onto the top of the hill, much like Sisyphus was trying to do. And, um, and so she's moving higher and higher. And, and so that was happening in the, in the 1900s. And, and so with women's clubs, they work to extend the homes. And there's a number of different women's clubs that existed. Um, the church groups were very important, and that was a place that women had um, you know, the ability to contribute to the strength of the church, you know, to create um, um, dinners in the basement of church, churches while the, um, the service was going on. So you could smell that good food and, and, uh, and congregate downstairs at the end of that. So ladies' aid societies did a lot of that with, you know, fundraising and um, sun Sunday school and other educational efforts in order to further the work of the church. Women's auxiliaries and men's clubs also allowed a place for women to organize and support the man's organization. So with the, the Masons, Eastern Star was a, a woman's auxiliary, or Rebecca's daughter was another, with the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the American Legion of the Civil War. And so soldiers from um, the Civil War organized themselves in the, the Grand Army of the Republic. And, and that organization had the Women's Relief Corps. And, um, and so women learned to organize that way as well. Then the Women's Christian Temperance Union, it's at the bottom, but that was organized in 1874 and you know, kind of took that idea of, the, of church groups along with the needs of society. The National Federation of Women's Clubs didn't organize until 1894, uh, and, um, and, and it was an umbrella organization. Um, and so individual study clubs would, that were at a local level would be part of a state group, which would be part of the national group. The National Federation's Women's Club was thought to be an upper class to upper middle class group of women. And they were very slow to embrace suffrage. But in North Dakota and Minnesota, they were a little bit earlier in doing that than the national group. North Dakota, um, their, their Federation of Women's Club supported and endorsed suffrage in 1914, and Minnesota did about that same time. But I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the WCTU, or the Women's Christian Temperance Union, tonight. And so with the WCTU as you know, the temperance union, anti-alcohol, and so we tend to categorize it as a, a single issue club, but it's a, it was a lot more than that in the 1800s. Uh, and the early 1900s. And that was because of Frances Willard, the woman pictured here, who was president, uh, the second president in 1879 until her death in 1898. And she was quite um, a strategist and um, was able to kind of think about how to expand the focus of, of the WCTU beyond temperance to social reform because she and the other women leading that organization could see that a lot of the things relating to alcohol abuse, you know, were, were part of societal issues and, you know, were greater than just abolishing or abstaining from the consumption of alcohol. And so 
Um, so that happened starting in 1879. And in 1881, she worked with Susan B. Anthony to figure out whether or not they should endorse suffrage. And so there was caution on, on part of both the Women's Christian Temperance Union, as well as the National uh, American Women's Suffrage Association, because they were both concerned about it. And with the WCTU, they were worried that, that it would dilute the, the club's focus on suffrage. And there were people in the WCTU who were anti-suffrage. And so you know, that was an issue for the WCTU. With the, the NASA, the women's, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, they were concerned that if, if the Women's uh, Christian Temperance Union was, was um, endorsing suffrage, that the liquor lobby would, would um, close down on suffrage and be totally against it. And indeed, that did happen in many states. But what Willard did was she allowed members to address local needs. And so, um, so members were able to work on suffrage if they felt that was appropriate. Or they could work on um, um, drives to develop a pure water supply or a garbage pickup or something of that sort. And so it just depend on, depended on the local members' um, interests and needs. And so that local control made the WCTU a very powerful entity. So with the WCTU in the, the 1880s um, and 90s and, and into the early part of the 1900s, they had these three initiatives and departments. And so one of them was home protection. And so within this initiative, within the home protection department, uh, our initiative, the franchise department um, was um, placed. And so the franchise department was giving women the right to vote. And so it was felt that ha women having the vote would allow women to truly protect their families and not be legally classified with children and the feeble-minded, which is what they called um, people who were, were um, mentally incompetent or um, having other issues with, with um, you know, mental illness. The Social Purity Initiative was one that focused, it, focused on several things relating to women and the oppression of women by men. Um, one of them was ending domestic violence. And so that was considered to be a social purity issue. Ending the double standard associated with sexuality. Well, we're still working on that. Ending the exploitation of women and children um, because they were concerned with women and children um, be ex being exploited in the labor market um, and in other ways as well. Um, and then another a way that they put this uh, initiative into practice was with life-saving stations at trail, train stations or railroad stations. This was something that was done in Fargo and the WCTU clubhouse was very close to the Northern Pacific Railroad Depot which is on Main Avenue between Broadway and, and A Street and, um, and so they would go to the other stations as well, the Great Northern as well as Milwaukee Road. They would look up when the trains were coming in and they would station a woman there who would look for people coming off the train who were, who were female and looking bewildered. And they would ask if they could assist them in finding lodging um, or assisting them in other ways. And so that was um, what a life-saving station was at the, the train stations. Then the Florence Crittenden home was a home for unwed mothers. And so during you know, this time period, if a young woman became pregnant out of wedlock, many times she was kicked out of the family. She was ostracized. And so the Florence Crittenden home was a place for a, a pregnant woman to live while she um, raised or, um, you know, went through her, her pregnancy and delivered the baby safely. Um, and they offered um, you know, care for the woman and, um, and then you know, would, would also operated an orphanage as well. Then the Do Every, Everything initiative, this was something that, that um, you know, they just encouraged the women who were members to do. Work on any issue, any social issue of concern, regardless of whether that was related to temperance. And so, you know, because of that do everything pol policy, um, the WCTU addressed a very broad a number of social issues. And so this is so, it's so interesting to read about this, it, you know, because when I first heard about the WCTU, I too believed it was a single issue entity, but I've learned that it was much broader than that. And so the WCTU served as a unifying force for broad social programs. It was very organized. And so it was set up 
um, to train women how to work together and how to, you know, to navigate locally to the state level, from the state level to the national level. And, um, and so it was interesting for other women to train in that. And it did train a number of women who went on to be uh, very um, uh, powerful women in the women's suffrage movement. And so the WCTU members viewed themselves as partners with men, men in ridding society from corruption and in resisting male oppression. And so you know, it was interesting that they had this very feminist um, ideology back in the late 1800s. As we move into more of the progressive era, this yellow sign that's on the uh, right-hand side of the screen shows a, um, a poster that, that would have um, gone up when the, the 1914 referendum on women's suffrage in North Dakota was being um, campaigned and lobbied. And so, so anyway, you can see how women's interests were the home, children, morals, and business. Give women the vote. They may help secure laws which will protect these interests and officials who will enforce the laws. And so the WCTU did champion women's moral authority to protect the home and family. They really felt that women had you know, this ability um, you know, to be morally pure uh, that men didn't have. And, uh, and so, they, you know, so the WCT worked with this um, in you know, getting uh, women the right to vote. So the WCT, you advocated for both individual improvements as well as community improvements. And it was a powerful organization. By 1911, it had almost a quarter of a million members. And so lots of women belong to it in the United States. With Kate Sibley Wilder and bringing it into a, a local uh, Fargo uh, view, excuse me, Kate Selby Wilder um, was born in 1876 in Pennsylvania, but she and her family moved to a homestead claim in um, North Dakota. Caledonia was the name of the town that was closest to it. It's by Mayville. And her father had been a Civil War soldier for three years. So three years of the five years of homesteading was um, not needed. So in two years, they were able to um, um, get the deed to the, the homestead and they moved into Grand Forks. And so that's where Kate Selby was, was raised. Um, she was educated there and grad, graduated from Grand Forks High School as, as valedictorian. She was married to Frank Wilder in 1901 and they moved to Fargo for his work. He was a member and uh, worked with the, um, an insurance organization. And, um, and so, so it was important for her to be involved with women's clubs you know, to help her husband be known um, and you know, to develop a reputation as you know, an honest businessman. And so she was an active member of the WCTU in part because her mother had been a men member and, um, and she had a lot of ability. And so by 1906, she was president of the Young Women's Club. And so that was a group of women for young unmarried women. And, um, and eventually she moved into more of the um, regular uh, uh, clubs at the WCTU unions in Fargo. By 1909, she was president of the Fargo Union. And so the Fargo Union had five separate WCTU um, groups. Um, two were Scandinavian and three were English. And so the Scandinavian groups, you know, they primarily were Norwegian, but other, uh, other Nordic languages were spoken. And, um, and so the Norwegians and Scandinavians were considered to be, you know, the recent immigrants. And so, you know, they were looked down upon. But yet the WCTU and other suffragists recognized the importance of Scandi Scandinavian women in getting the support of rural people especially, um, because Scandinavian countries were much more pro-suffrage and acted, um, enacted women's voting rights earlier than the United States. And, um, and so anyway, so that was an important aspect she, um, that she dealt with. That, that year she also became involved at the North Dakota level as superintendent of press work. So she wrote press releases and, and really kind of was involved with the comings and goings and getting the information out to the local newspapers um, for a number of years. In 1915, she became state speaker. And so she was recognized as being a good orator 
And so she was sent out by the North Dakota Votes for, or the WCTU rather, to different um, places in the, in the state that, that wished to have um, programming. And, and so generally it went along with the train tracks. And, and so um, she would you know, travel a, like to Dickinson, but also go to Glen Allen and Amidon and other places of that sort in that part of the world to speak. She was also a, a member, a very active member of the Fort Knightley Club. And this helped her to become more educated um, because they focused on sociology. And, and it was a, a group of very influential women in Fargo. Um, this Fort Knightley Club was a part of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. And one of the things that, that each club had to do at the state level is show how their club differentiated from other clubs in the same area. Um, because they didn't want to have two clubs overlapping in you know their purpose, um, and so it was um, there was a little bit of control by that um, North Dakota Federation of Women's Club uh, clubs uh, over the local individuals. The just as an aside, the the um, WCTU at the the state level was and at the national level were auxiliary members of the general federation of women's clubs because they were a women's club and so that made the general federation of women's club the largest women's club in the nation um, she was also an active member in the business and professional women's clubs and um, and, um, and then many others she you know every day of the week she probably had something that she had to do uh, in 1912, that proved to be a significant year for suffrage in the United States. And, and that was because of the presidential election and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he um, did not get the Republican nomination. William Howard Taft did. And so he um, you know, took his um, associates and started what he called the Bull Moose Pro, Pro, um, Party. But that was, um, he was uh, uh, nominated by the Progressive Party to be their presidential candidate. And, um, and so uh, it's interesting to see this slide with Theodore Roosevelt looking quite buff, holding a big stick, as well as the bull moose. Um, then you see the Republican elephant you know, with, with Howard Taft on top wading down the party, and the trunk of the elephant is swinging over to Teddy Roosevelt, as well as the, one of his feet, the elephant's feet. Then other people that were candidates at that time include, included Eugene Debs. The socialism was uh, something that um, you know, was uh, a growing uh, interest in the United States at that time. And so the GOAT was their party symbol. It's also the, the symbol of the Nonpartisan League in North Dakota, in Minnesota. So um, it's interesting to see, see that tie. Um, and then Woodrow Wilson is sitting astride the, the donkey and the docking is you know, turning and looking and, huh, what's going on? And, and because of the splitting of the Republican ticket, Wilson was the one that won. And, and so, um, so the suffragists had him to deal with um, during the 1910s once he was elected and took office in, in 1913. With the Fortnightly Club, you know, that, that club provided the nexus for the North, North Dakota Votes for Women's League. And so this organization started in of 1912, February 4th, to be exact. And, and so with that club, they had invited Sylvia Pankhurst, one of the uh, members of the Pankhurst family of British militant suffragists. And what um, Emmeline Pankhurst, the mother, and then her daughters would do is they would go out on speaking tours throughout the United States to raise money for the British suffrage cause. But you know, some money would, would go to local entities as well. But she was invited by Helen Delandrecy and Clara Doro, and probably um, other, uh, uh, somebody by the last name of Walker had uh, a theater and, and had a, a theater circuit. So he was involved in, in, uh, you know, in booking acts in Grand Theater as well as other theaters in Fargo. And so anyway, Sylvia Pankhurst arrived on a very cold winter day in February and stayed at the home of, of Clara Darrow. Um, she was hosted by Mary Weibel, Clara Darrow's daughter. And, um, and they invited the, um, these um, individuals in that were members of the Fort Knightley Club. And they came up with the idea of, of establishing the Votes for Women's League and they decided who was going to be president and vice president, secretary, assistant secretary, treasurer, assistant uh, 
treasure and and so all these women that are are um, listed in in um, in the font here um, were folks that were involved in that that club so Kate Selby Wilder was the secretary and so the beautiful penmanship that I have from the excerpt of that minutes book um, is Kate Selby Wilder's handwriting um, it's interesting to see she was a, she had good penmanship and so Wilder, during that time, she was active in the Progressive Party. She felt that, that the Progressive Party's um, platform agreed with her beliefs. And so she became chairperson of the Women's Progressive uh, of Women for the Progressive Party Club. She worked with uh, Moorhead suffragist Anna Gates, as well as others. And um, one of the things that they did in um, and, um, this time period was hosted Jane Addams in Fargo and Grand Forks. And, um, and she was the person that seconded Theodore Roosevelt's nomination for the Progressive Party um, presidential candidacy. Um, but she, she became very famous because she was the head resident of the Hull House Settlement in Chicago. And the settlement house settle, um, idea that, that um, movement, settlement house movement, would um, offer a place for generally women immigrants um, to come and live and become educated, to learn English language, to learn a trade, um, to go out and you know be successful citizens. And, and so that settlement house movement was found in Chicago, but other places as well. Um, and, um, and so with Kate Selby Wilder, she was um, the spokesperson, sp spokesperson for progressive party candidates. And she lobbied the legislature as well as as the votes for women's league to um, send a suffrage re referendum to the voters. And so in November 1914, the citizens of North Dakota, the voters of North Dakota, had the the uh, the chance of voting suffrage and to uh, uh, into the into law. OK, here we go. And so this is a um, um, newspaper from the Oaks time. They were lobbying for Suffrage Sunday, February 9th, 1913. And, um, and so on that day, the Votes for Women's League appeals for help to, um, to all clergymen. And so Clara Darrow, the president of the Votes for Women's League, has, has um, ordered um, to have February 9th set aside as Suffrage Sunday. On that day, every minister and priest of every creed and denomination is urged to speak for suffrage from the pulpit and to lay it upon his congregation as an act of human justice to secure the passage of the suffrage bill endorsed by the state votes for Women's League. Now, that's now before our legislature at Bismarck. Our state must be made cleaner, safer, a better place for the growth of homes, schools, churches, all the institutions that make for righteousness. This will be done none too quickly, even if we all work together with every weapon we each command. The ballot is in the hands of, the ballot in the hands of women is one unused tool within our reach. And this was signed um, the North Dakota uh, programming chair Beulah Amidon, who is the wife of, of Judge Amidon, uh, a federal judge in this area. And so people went out in force for the, um, to gain um, support for the North Dakota constitutional referendum for, for women's suffrage. And Kate Selby Wilder is one that went out in the field from April 1913 until November 1914, so, so for, for over a year. She represented both the WCTU and the North Dakota Votes for Women's League. And, and so both of those organizations would have supported her travel. Um, and um, and hotels and and perhaps provided a bit of a stipend for her. They used a nonpartisan approach. The Votes for Women's League did, as well as the WCTU. They uh, visited with with um, the the men who were in the legislature and asked if they supported suffrage, and if they did, they supported that person, that man, and um, and so this nonpartisan approach precedes the nonpartisan league and the establishment of that in 1915. Automobiles were also really important to the cause of suffrage, you know, because they were new, people were intrigued by them. And so women would, would um, find somebody who would lend them a car, a nice car preferably, and you know, they would drive it to a busy place in town in front of 
um, one of the the corners of a hotel um, in Grand Forks. Um, there were uh, there was four different hotels that that there's um, records of and and that votes for women's club minutes book that um, uh, show how the women where the women parked and and who was the one um, speaking and so they would would um, stand in the back of the car and if you look at um, this woman this is Clara Darrow and you can see somebody standing in the back here speaking to the crowd um, then there's also women sitting in the car and then it looks like somebody um, perhaps standing with them but um, you know all these individuals are are you know looking at the camera but you know, hopefully they were listening to the speaker as well and so Clara Darrow was the one that was driving um, the car in this parade she was the president of the North Dakota Votes for Women's League but um, also in this picture um, is uh, Mrs. Conchetta Ferris Lutz. She was uh, from the Minnesota Equal Suffrage League. And then Julia B. Nelson, um, she was also from the Minnesota Equal Suffrage League. Both were from Red Wing, Minnesota. And uh, Julia Nelson especially was known for being a very eloquent and forceful speaker on behalf of suffrage. So they went out and, and um, campaigned on behalf of North Dakota women. Uh, another thing that that happened in the summer is that that um, people would set up booths at the uh, different fairs and so this is a picture that that shows suffragists campaigning for the vote at the Botano County Fair in July of, of 1914 and you can see behind the women on the tent a sign that says restroom and then you see votes for and then November 5th, 1914. If we were to see a, a larger blow up of this picture, I cropped it. Um, above the, the women on the right side, you know, this sign says WCTU. Um, so that's uh, sponsored there. As you look at these women, um, it looks like a very hot day and it looks like the kids are tired. And, um, and so um, the women are doing their best to look good though. And one of the things that, that suffragists try to do as they went out into the public to campaign for the vote, they did their best to look their best, to dress their best. And in the summer, a very fashionable dress um, and thing to wear was a white summer dress. And so as you look at this picture, you see several women that ha are wearing white or really uh, it could be pastels, um, some wearing darker dresses as well. And so on the corners, I have a, a white dress that was worn by Kate Selby Wilder, as well as Kate Selby Wilder herself. And so in the Emily Reynolds costume collection, we have a number of items that were worn by Kate Selby Wilder. And some of them we've dated to be, um, you know, to have been part of her wardrobe during the time of the suffrage campaign. And this white lingerie dress is one of them. It dates from about 1914 to about 1915. It has a square neck and, and kimono-like sleeves. That was a popular and thing that came with a Japanese influence. It has a, a wider belt that's not quite as um, uh, cinched in like the early 1900s. And, and so the lingerie dress was a fashionable summer dress. And, um, and so, you know, women wore white. It's interesting to then look at, at um, you know, this picture from the New York Tribune of women marching down Fifth Avenue. And it, it shows how against the black tarmac, how that the white outfits of women, it made that was on the front of the New York Tribune. Um, and, and so suffrage pr uh, parades became a common way of women getting out. And they followed the, the women's labor movement to dress as nicely as uh, possible to appeal to the public. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the ways that, that they worked it out. And so the, the 1914 North Dakota ref referendum failed. The same referendum was um, passed by the legislators of uh, South Dakota and Montana and went to the voters, but only Montana's was ratified. And so South Dakota and North Dakota had to wait longer for uh, suffrage to um, come into being. But Montana, they, that was, they became a suffrage state in 1914. Minnesota didn't become a, a, a suffrage state for a partial suffrage until 1919. But early on in the um, the eighteen late say eighteen seventies I think it was they became um, it was avail available for women to vote for library boards and then later on in the eighteen nineties uh, Minnesota women could vote for a school board and run for school board 
elections or school elections. One of the things that, that uh, was part of the North Dakota Constitution is this clause, a majority of all those voting at the election was needed for an amendment to the Constitution to pass. So this became part of the North Dakota Constitution you know, when the, uh, the Constitution came into being in 1889. This was something that wasn't in the Minnesota Constitution, but it was added. It was a, an amendment that went through in 1898. And so it made it much harder to amend the Constitution. Um, and so with North Dakota's vote on this referendum, there were 40,000 votes for suffrage and that were counted for suffrage. And um, against suffrage, there were 49,348. And, and so the way that they counted was it was based on the total votes that, that were cast. But when they went back and counted the total votes for candidates, there were 200 less votes. And so the, and they, what, what um, was frustrating for North Dakota suffrage women was that the people that were running the election polls were not um, counseled and educated on, on what to do with the ballots. And so once they counted them, they threw them away and burned them. So they couldn't go back and do a recount. And so, you know, it did foster a change in, in election policies. Um, in North Dakota and South Dakota, Minnesota, uh, women were disappointed for a very long time until 1919, but they proceeded on. And so with, with this little excerpt, it shows how the WCTU um, um, uh, started an a institute, and that was in the uh, 1915. And so they, the WCTU voted, excuse me, invited both WCTU members from North Dakota and from Minnesota to come to this institute to learn about what was going on um, on the state level as well as state levels as well as nationally, because then there was a push for the 18th Amendment, which was the amendment for prohibition. And so there was there was this idea that came across that until pro, the amendment um, prohibiting the manufacturing and sale of alcohol in the United States, that uh, the, um, the vote for women's suffrage would not go through, the, an amendment, a federal amendment would not go, go through. And so the WCT really began to concentrate on that. In 1917, women were granted limited suffrage, partial suffrage. And, and so we have a, a picture of Governor Frazier signing the women's suffrage bill. On his right-hand side was Elizabeth Preston Anderson, this woman on the right that I'm circling. She was the president for many years of the North Dakota Women's Christian Temperance Union. And every legislative session, she would attend the, you know, the, um, the committee hearings as well as the full uh, legislative uh, Senate and House hearings. Um, to um, you know, hear what what was going on, and so she was known uh, by you know Republicans and Democrats as well as nonpartisans um, as a the woman that was promoting suffrage, and uh, and so he was a, elected as a Republican, but on the nonpartisan league um, platform, and and so the one of the first bills that was passed in 1917 was a limited suffrage bill. So this granted women the right to vote for presidential elector. And, and so with this, women could vote for, you know, the Republican or uh, Democratic candidate or whatever party it would be. But like all of us today, we will vote for the candidate, but who casts the vote is the electoral college and the people that are, are voted upon to represent the state at the, um, the, when the electoral college meets. And so women received this vote in 1917 in North Dakota, but they also received the vote, the right to vote for county and municipal elections that weren't it, written in the Constitution. Minnesota suffrage in 1919, it was before um, the federal suffrage amendment was passed. So they had a year of partial suffrage before, um, uh, before the federal amendment was passed. During World War I, the National Women's Party, um, the, which was a, a, a party that was focusing on getting a federal amendment uh, for women's suffrage, they decided to picket the White House in order to gain attention for the cause. And so between 1917 and 1919, every day 
um, they went out to the gates of the White House and, and sometimes the Capitol with banners such as this protesting President Wilson not supporting the suffrage amendment. President Wilson was very hedgy and he voted for a state by state and supported state suffrage. So if a state wanted to have suffrage, you know, he supported that. But he did not support the federal suffrage amendment until um, 1918. So eventually he came around and supported it. And part of it was, was um, you know, because of the, the picketing that, you know, he would see driving in and out of the White House. And, you know, the, the, um, the women were called silent sentinels because they wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't chant. They would just stand there uh, for a certain amount of time. And, or they would walk. It looks like in this picture they're walking. And they would have these banners, some of them which would pull from, from phrases that came from speeches that President Wilson made. And people were angry at this. And so they would be roughed up by people that walked by, by uh, men um, or sailors or whoever it was. Their signs would be ripped down and trampled. And you know they would try to, to discourage the women from doing this. Eventually, they started arresting them and then they would release them when that when they still didn't quit they would arrest them and they charged them and and gave them fines but again they you know they sometimes the fines were dismissed other times they would pay them but they'd be back out on, out on the picket line um, doing the same thing so then they upped up up the ante they increased the, the ante and, and they began to put women in jail and then eventually in the aquacon workhouse which was a um, substandard uh, prison facility that uh, was out in Virginia there um, and and so at that place the the um, women who had been arrested underwent hunger strikes and forced feedings and this became you know headlines in newspapers across the nation and began to make people you know say well you know these women are are you know be, being harmed by the fact that they're not represented and they can't vote. And, um, and so it, it turned the tide of, of human support or helped to turn the tide. There, you know, North Dakota and Minnesota did um, keep informed of what was going on because there were local people that, that uh, went and protested. One of them was Miss Beulah, Beulah Amidon. She was a judge of Charles Amidon and then his wife Beulah who had written that article um, that we saw earlier. And so she was involved as press secretary for the National Women's Party. And she was arrested, um, but there's not a record of her being in jail. There's, there are sources that say she was jailed, but there's not evidence that we've found yet to back that up. Some other people that protested include um, Mary Darrow Weibel, who was a Fargo suffragist, as well as Edith Darrow Godfrey who was a, a Moorhead suffragist. They had traveled in 1917 and protested for a while in front of the White House. And so, you know, there, as women, you know, went to national conventions, you know, they were asked if they would be willing to protest and they would do that. Then during World War I, women um, aided the war effort. And so um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, they wanted women to, to uh, put their efforts towards the Liberty Loan campaign, towards helping the war effort with the Red Cross, as well as teaching about Liberty Gardens and growing them and, you know, and working with food conservation and preservation. And so all of these things, women in North Dakota, as well as Minnesota, um, were involved. And the exhibit War, Flu and Fear, Fear um, World War One in Clay County, that's on now at the Yamcom Center does a good job of talking about each of these issues, and it's it, it's wonderful to see hand knitted knitted items that were part of the effort, the Red Cross effort to knit clothing items. And so there's a a, a little sweater vest that a soldier had been given when he was overseas in France, and and uh, you know brought that back. Um, bandaged production. You know, there's lots of quotes in the exhibit that talk about how men come in with many wounds um, from, you know, being in battle. And sometimes nine or 10 rolls of bandages are used um, trying to stem the bleeding of the individuals. And so it's a real powerful exhibit. I encourage you to, to see that. But Kate Selby Wilder was involved in that. And she became chief of Women's Bureau of Speakers for North Dakota. I don't know much about the, the Minnesota effort. I know that it went on and that that um, 
Clara Euland and other individuals were, that were involved in Minnesota suffrage were heavily involved in, in the war effort. Um, but with, with uh, the effort in North Dakota, Hazel B. Nielsen, who had been um, a state superintendent of public instruction, um, as well as the president of the North Dakota, of the North Dakota Federation of Women's Clubs, um, was in charge of the Liberty Loan Campaign and, and women's war efforts. And, you know, women really did a good job of getting out there and, and you know, getting support for the war. And, and people recognized that. Um, women volunteered for the Red Cross as ambulance drivers, as canteen hostesses. Um, and, um, and so, you know, they went overseas as well and, and uh, were involved, um, you know, in the real close to the battle sites. But she took advantage of the fact that North Dakota allowed partial suffrage. And so she decided that she was going to run for Fargo City Commission. And so she worked her women's clubs network and, and gained their support. Um, she went out and campaigned before the trade unions and, um, and expressed her support of the, a municipal electrical generating plant in Fargo. And I can remember when I was very small that behind um, what is now Old Broadway and what used to be CI Apparel, you know, kind of by Renaissance Hall, there's a great big munici municipal power plant that uh, MSP, Northern States Power, ran. And that that was the, the municipal electrical generating plant that Kate Selby Wilder and her, her um, support helped to build. I know that Moorhead still has Moorhead Public Service. And so, you know, so this was, um, you know, a, a state uh, or a city developed um, um, policy or entity that allowed electricity to move into, you know, the, the city more readily than than would have been uh, available without this organized effort. And so when she was elected, she lobbied and received the police portfolio. And she is thought to have been the first woman city, or excuse me, first woman police commissioner in the nation. And one of the things that, that her family talk about how she was so proud of the gun that she received to protect herself. <laughs> and, and so she held that portfolio two years and, and did very well. But in um, 1921, there was another municipal election. And so then they, they um, you know, reorganized the portfolios. She was given the public health portfolio. Her son-in-law said that that allied with her interests a little bit more you know, because she was concerned with maternal and child health. And so during that time, one of the things that, that, um, that she kind of set the works um, going is, is establishing the public health um, department um, with the city of Fargo and Cass County. She served only one term. And so um, she ran again, but she was not elected a second time. And so she went back to, um, to working for uh, the Right for Women to Vote, um, for the WTTU and the, the many different uh, organizations and, and you know, teaching efforts that they had. But the, the work that women had with the uh, club networks, they built support across the nation for prohibition and for women's suffrage. And so the um, 18th Amendment was ratified January 16, 1919 but it was proposed in 1917, so during the war still. The 19th Amendment for Women's Suffrage was proposed June 4th, and it was ratified the 18th of August and certified the 26th of August, 1920. And so with women's clubs, they helped to expand human rights as advocates and reformers, and they allowed women to give voice to their aspirations. And so, you know, this is essentially the, the end of my pre uh, presentation, but I do have some other things that, that relate to the celebration of, of the centennial of women's suffrage. So one of the things that, that if you're a Twitter user or Instagram or wherever they have hashtags, um, pound 19th at 100 is the hashtag that people add to um, posts about women's suffrage in the centennial celebration. Um, I had the, the, the opportunity to have two chapters in this book, Equality at the Ballot Box, that was edited by Lori Lallum and Molly Rosam. Um, and um, so that, that's available if you're interested in reading about the Northern Plains being North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. Um, and so we touch on Minnesota where it relates to these other um, states, but it's you know, essentially those four states. Um, and, um, and then with, with um, 
um, the Yemkomst and the, uh, um, I always get the name wrong, the Heritage, called Heritage and Cultural Society of Clay County. Um, they're hosting a talk by Deb White on Nellie Griswold Francis, Every Women's Suffrage Club Celebrating Minnesota's Women Suffragists. And Nellie Griswold Francis was a black woman, an African American woman, who was uh, the president of, the chair, chairperson of the Every Woman Suffrage Club, which was a black woman's suffrage club in St. Paul in Minneapolis. And so she she's going to present on that. Then in October, there's going to be a century of civic engagement sponsored by the League of Women, or about the League of Women Voters in Minnesota. Um, and then the Red River Women's Studies Conference is coming up October 23rd, 2020. It's an online conference. Um, and the theme is imperfect history, focus on suffrage, the right to vote, and the challenges to the vote that exist yet today. And so that's coming up and, and there's a call. If you look at NDSU Women and Gender Studies online, you'll be able to find that call. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that's worth pointing out is that not all women in the United States benefited in 1920 from ratification in an equal fashion. Native American women finally earned U.S. citizenship rights in 1924, and that provided voting rights. Prior to that, if a Native American gave up their Indianness and um, um, and you know proved with you know different ways of of showing that they were um, qualified to be a U.S. citizen, then they could vote. But for all all Native Americans, it did not occur until 1924. Um, Chinese women immigrants received the right to vote in 1943, and then with the Jim Crow laws and, and that you know are really kind of still in effect, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 increased opportunities for African American women to vote and men to vote. But um, despite all this, uh, with this legislation and laws policies, um, you know there there um, there are ways that women are, and men are still prevented from voting. So we still have work to do. But with with um, this, I'm going to go. I'm just going to flick through these next two screens so they appear on the recording. Um, there's a, a chronology that, that I put together that just show what what happened with women's enfranchisement uh, for Minnesota, which is on the left, and North Dakota, which on, is on the right. Um, and um, and so uh, Minnesota went became a state earlier, and so Minnesota had a right to vote on school questions earlier. And I guess I was just it was opposite about um, the school question versus library boards. Um, but um, North Dakota women received partial suffrage, which was for presidential electors and offices not listed in the state constitution in 1917. And so that you know it kind of moved women's suffrage forward. Then I also have a list of illustrations that were used and then also references that were used. That, so I, I just wanted to have those available on uh, the uh, on the recording and so should i stop sharing emily okay if i do that um, are there any questions that people have on the chat line or anything of that sort yeah so we're going to open up the um the questions now so i'm watching on facebook so if anybody who is okay. joining us live on facebook um, has a question uh, they can type it into the comments there um, and if any of the Zoomers have any questions, they can um, either raise their hand um, or type it into the chat box there below. I'm not seeing any questions from anybody. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining us for our first Zoom and Facebook webinar. Um, I think we had a great success uh, for our first one and um, do join us uh, Next week, we do have a uh, book talk from Terry Shopta next Tuesday at 6 p.m. You can join us here on Facebook again and on Zoom. And then next Wednesday, we will have Deb White's talk um, on Nellie Griswold Francis as well. So 
All right. Thank you, Anne. All right. Thank you, Emily. Bye now, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.